Okay, for our third lecture, we are going to move into our first uh, sort of uh, deep dive into a, a very iconic and infamous um, type of environmental disaster, and that is um, a nuclear disaster. And we're going to focus uh, specifically on the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. So this first part of the lecture is going to introduce us, get us to the point of Chernobyl, and then the next lecture will be um, a discussion of Chernobyl itself. So nuclear power, environmental disaster, and Chernobyl. So nuclear power, let's talk about nuclear power. In order to understand nuclear power, we need to talk about nuclear fusion versus nuclear fission. And before we get to even that, we have to talk about protons and neutrons, neutrons and atoms. So in an atom, right, protons and neutrons are held together in the nucleus, not by electrostatic forces, but by nuclear forces, okay? There are forces which hold uh, the nucleus itself together, and not surprisingly, these are called nuclear forces. This is unlike the force that holds electrons to an atom, um, which is an electrostatic force, right? So if we take two nuclei, two different atoms, and we smash them together, we combine them together. This is a process known as nuclear fusion. This is what the sun does. This is how the sun produces light and heat energy, okay? This theoretically generates a ton of electricity, and in fact it does. Like, I mean, look at the sun. The sun, where is it? Right here. Uh, the sun is, is bright, there's a lot of energy um, that's being produced by the sun. And so theoretically, if you could figure out a way to do this on Earth, you could generate a lot of electricity. But as of yet, we're really unable to replicate this in a lab in an effective way that we could scale up to produce a lot of energy. In the sun, four hydrogen nuclei combine together to produce helium. Okay? Uh, in a, in a process of, um, of hydrogen fusion, right? Um, and this produces a ton of energy, which is then emitted from the sun, and which, you know, gives us life on Earth, actually. Um, however, for very heavy elements, okay, so hydrogen, helium, these are really light element, elements with not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of mass, not a lot of protons, not a lot of neutrons, electrons, etc. So for very heavy elements, uh, nuclear fusion is no longer exothermic, which means it no longer is uh, productive in, in giving off lots of heat and energy. Okay, so the lighter the element, the better the energy production from nuclear fusion. So here on Earth, in order to derive energy from nuclear processes, we turn to nuclear fission, which is different than nuclear fusion. And nuclear fission, instead of combining two atoms together, we are ripping one atom apart, the nucleus of one atom apart. Uh, typically, the atom that we are referring to is uranium. And the way this works is that we hit an unstable isotope of uranium. An isotope is a version of an atom that has slightly more neutrons than it normally should, okay, then the periodic table says that it should. So if it has more neutrons in the nucleus, it's an isotope. It's different than the, the periodic table version of the element, but it's still the element. So some elements can exist with lots of these extra sort of radioactive um, components uh, and still be relatively stable. Uranium is one of those, okay, but the second that we hit, for example, uranium-235 with a neutron, it becomes extremely unstable, okay, and it breaks apart in a process known as nuclear fission. It, it sort of explodes apart. So part of what happens is it forms two new atoms, um, which you can see here, right? It also produces a lot of energy you can see depicted here. 
And most importantly, we hit it with one extra neutron. But the instability of the reaction actually releases three neutrons. So we hit it with one. Okay, so it's an isotope. It's, it's just barely still stable, but it's considered radioactive. We hit it with one single neutron. It produces a lot of energy, two atoms, two new atoms, and three additional neutrons. So one goes in, three comes out, and a lot of energy. This is important because the way that we make this work to our advantage for electricity and energy production is through a process known as a chain reaction. And I have a little video that I'm going to show um, in just a moment. So nuclear fission of heavy elements was discovered on December 17, 1938 by Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, but it was actually explained theoretically by Lisa Meitner, who was actually an exiled Jewish woman, exiled from, from Nazi Germany at the time, um, a physicist, and uh, she was contacted and they said, look, we were in a lab and we, um, we did this thing and got all this energy and and all these extra neutrons, like, can you explain this uh, to us? And she did. Um, she's often not credited with the discovery itself, um, but she did write the scientific paper um, that explained why this was happening, the physics behind what's going on here. So basically, if you bombard a uranium ion with one neutron, it splits the uranium into two smaller elements and produces three additional neutrons and some binding energy. And the reason why this is important is because this is what's considered a chain reaction. So because you're hitting it with just a single neutron and it's producing three new neutrons, okay, each time it's going to exponentially grow the amount of neutrons that you are emitting from each bombardment. So if you have a container full of radioactive uranium and you hit just one of those uranium atoms with a single neutron, that produces three neutrons, which can then hit three individual uranium ions, right, uranium ion atoms, which each of those three uraniums that gets hit produces three more neutrons, which can now go on to affect 27, no, sorry, nine <laughs> uranium atoms, and then 27, yep, uranium atoms, 81, etc. okay, so a chain reaction, it very quickly grows to this boom, 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 boom. It's like dominoes falling um, and kind of igniting this entire chamber of radioactive uranium. If those neutrons don't find a radioactive uranium or a uranium that's stable, a uranium atom that's stable, then the reaction will end. So you want to make sure that if you're trying to get nuclear energy through a nuclear fission process, you are... Um, creating and filling a container full of these radioactive uranium-235, for example, um, isotopes. Okay, and I've got an example on this, but let me, let me walk through the, the history of this. Uh, actually, um, I'm going to show the video, the video first. All right, so here we go. At the bottom of the periodic table, beginning with number 84, polonium, all of the elements and their isotopes are radioactive, including the element that stands for both the promise and the peril of radioactivity, uranium. 92 protons, 92 electrons, and 146 neutrons. Before the nuclear age, uranium was thought to be the end of the periodic table. But in the last 70 years, scientists have left nature behind and created 26 new elements. The age of man-made atoms began in the first half of the 20th century, when researchers began bombarding elements with neutrons. Sometimes the neutron is simply absorbed, creating a new isotope. But sometimes the nucleus can't take the punishment. It becomes unstable and splits into two smaller atoms in a powerful reaction called fission that releases large amounts of energy. To learn more, I've come to the Nuclear Museum in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
Yeah, this is a mad science project. Where atomic scientist Matt Dennis has offered to demonstrate how a nuclear reactor works. You guys make a lot of jokes about gone fishing. I actually have an atomic shirt that says something to that effect. I knew that! Yes. I knew that! Okay, now to the naked eye, this looks exactly like a nuclear reactor. The similarities are the mouse traps are uranium atoms and the white ping pong balls are neutrons, which you use one to start a chain reaction. In a reactor, one neutron splits a uranium atom, which releases energy and two or three more neutrons, which in turn split more atoms, releasing more neutrons, and so on, causing a chain reaction. So you get more and more neutrons, and thus the chain reaction keeps going. All right, ladies and jelly spoons, here goes the orange ping pong ball. This evening's role, you'll be portraying the neutron. All right, I just drop it in here. And you just drop place. it in right there, and we'll start the chain reaction. Incoming neutron! <laughs> I'm sorry, Matt. The camera wasn't rolling. Can you set that up again? From a single neutron, an escalating response. Our mousetrap reactor doesn't have many atoms, so the reaction dies quickly but pack enough fissionable uranium atoms closely enough together, and the whole thing can get out of hand pretty fast. Okay. <clears throat> that is, in my opinion, a, a really great explainer of, um, of what a nuclear fission reaction is, how it works, and how we can use that to derive um, a lot of energy from just a single sort of uh, neutron and a very complicated chamber full of, of radioactive uranium. A deleterious effect of this, of course, is a nuclear weapon. So you can also use this process in a less controlled way to explode a bomb. It makes sense, right? It's using the same principle, but instead of generating electricity in a controlled way in a power plant, you just blow it up and it, and it, and it creates this, this nuclear bomb, which has a ton of energy um, and can be incredibly devastating. So let's walk through the history of nuclear uh, fission and the implications of that, both with the, 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 the harmful side of things, the bomb, and then the energy side of things, the nuclear power side of things. So um, in 1934, so slightly before um, Lisa Meitner um, was able to write about nuclear fission, Fermi, um, of the famous Fermi Labs, right, uh, first discovered that you could bombard a uranium ion with a neutron to produce two smaller elements with 93 and 94 protons. He initially called these elements ausonium and hesperium. They now have actual names. You can look in the periodic table. I can never remember them off the top of my head. Not a chemist, but this was in 1934. Fast forward, Lisa Meitner again was an Austrian Jew who fled Germany in the 1930s and took refuge in Sweden and was corresponding with the chemist Hahn by mail. In 1938, by accident, Hahn um, discovered nuclear fission um, and is sort of credited with this, even though he had no idea um, what, was, what was necessarily um, going on. I guess very typical that a, a clueless male scientist would be credited with the discovery over Lisa Minor, who eventually ended up explaining the whole thing. But what he did is in a, in a chemistry lab, he bombarded uranium with a neutron, which produced barium, and then corresponded with Meitner to, to help explain what the hell was going on. So here's a description of the process by Lisa Meitner's nephew, um, and I'm just going to read it out loud. The charge of uranium nucleus we found was indeed large enough to overcome the effect of surface tension on the on the nucleus completely. So the uranium nucleus might indeed resemble a very wobbly, unstable drop, right? So it's it's barely stable, ready to divide itself at the slightest provocation, such as the impact of a single neutron. There's another problem. After separation, the two drops would be driven apart by their mutual electric repulsion and would acquire high speed and hence a very large energy. Where could that energy come from? Lisa Meitner worked out that the two nuclei formed by the division of 
the uranium nucleus together would be lighter than the original uranium nucleus by about one-fifth the mass of a proton. Now, whenever mass disappears, energy is created. And according to Einstein's formula, and one-fifth of a proton mass was just equivalent to uh, 200 um, megavolts. So here was the source for that energy. It all fit. -ted. Fit. Okay, so you basically like um, split these atoms apart. You get two, three neutrons, and then you also get a bunch of excess energy. And it's that energy that we're after, both for electricity production or um, if you're malicious for, for a weapon. So... In 1942, okay, um, right during World War II, Chicago Pile 1 was actually the first nuclear reactor in the world. Um, and started by Fermi and others. And most of the work done on the Manhattan Project, right, and uh, on our understanding of nuclear power and nuclear weapons was done at Argonne National Laboratory. Right, which is right here in the suburbs of Chicago, where Chicago Pile 1, the first nuclear reactor, was located. Um, and this uh, consequently, became, consequently became the first national lab in the United States in 1946. Argonne West, which is now called the Idaho National Lab, set up in Idaho, not in Chicago, right, produced the first nuclear-generated electricity. This is after the war, after the bomb was deployed, after we realized maybe we shouldn't be setting off nuclear weapons, maybe we should be using this for nuclear power instead. Um, so this at Argonne West, uh, which is now the Idaho National Lab, this is where the first nuclear generated electricity occurred. In 1953, President Eisenhower at the time gave an Atoms for Peace speech at the UN, emphasizing the need to develop peaceful uses of nuclear power rather than um, harmful ones like, like weapons. Um, of course, this was in the height of the Cold War, um, the U.S. and the USSR were rapidly developing nuclear weapons as well as expanding their infrastructure for nuclear power. And in 1954, in an additional attempt to de-escalate some of the nuclear weapons production, um, Eisenhower and Congress passed the amendments to the Atomic Energy Act, which allowed for rapid declassification of U.S. reactor technology and encouraged development by the private se sector of nuclear power plants. Using the nuclear fission technology that was developed in the 40s, um, we're now encouraging, um, instead of the production of bombs, the production of nuclear power plants. In 1954, similarly, similar things are going on in the USSR. The USSR first connected a nuclear power plant to their electricity grid, okay, state-run, and then in 1956, the first commercial, non-state-run, private, capitalist, whatever, however you want to refer to it, nuclear power plant opened in the United Kingdom. So beginning around this time, in 1955 or so, the use of nuclear power as an electricity generation, generating um, uh, concept, rose from one gigawatt in 1960 to 300 gigawatts in the late 1980s. Of course, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, which occurred in the late 70s and, 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 and late 80s, kind of slowed nuclear power plant development and put it on hold until it was revitalized in the early 2000s. And then again in 2001, the Fukushima disaster again put um, nuclear power plant development on hold. We can look at that um, on these graphs here myself out of the way. Um, so we can see the blue line here shows the installed capacity of global nuclear power. Okay, so beginning in 1960, it's very low. It ramps up very quickly through the 70s and 80s, and then it sort of comes to a halt right here, corresponding to the Chernobyl accidents. We have the Three Mile nuclear power disaster, the Chernobyl disaster and then the Fukushima disaster. And so you can see of all of the reactors under construction and active, construction really ramps up in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, slows after Three Mile Island. People are like spooked a little. Oh boy, we better, um, we better chill out on this for a second. 
and then really comes to almost a halt after Chernobyl. So Chernobyl, which happened in 1987, really put the development of nuclear power plants on hold um, for decades. They started to rebound again in the mid-2000s, and then the Fukushima disaster happened in 2001, again putting nuclear power plant um, construction on, on hold. Okay, so for some reason, these nuclear disasters had uh, a very important effect on the global psyche of, of, of people, enough so that they actually could halt an entire industry from progressing. Um, the same has not happened for fossil fuels, even though we know that fossil fuels both cause environmental disasters and are causing climate change, which is the environmental disaster. Those haven't put on, been put on hold, but nuclear power generation um, responds very dramatically to um, these individual uh, environmental disaster incidents. So here we can see each year the number of construction starts for nuclear power plants, right? Peaks in the late 60s, mid 70s, okay? So you've got 30 or more nuclear power plants under construction in the 1960s, 1970s after the Three Mile Island, Three Mile Island, Three Mile Island accident in 1979. You can see that construction slows, and then after the Chernobyl accident in 19, 1987, basically comes to a halt. Very few new nuclear power plants are 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 started. It starts to ramp up in the late 2000s, in the late aughts, and then in 2011 you have Fukushima, which essentially again puts everything on hold, and we've We've not quite rebounded uh, ever, and, and maybe we never will rebound to the to the activity that we were doing in the 1970s and 1960s. Okay, sorry, the Chernobyl accident was in 1986. I don't know why I keep saying 1987. So Three Mile Island. Let's talk about Three Mile Island uh, briefly, because this preceded, uh, predated Chernobyl. It occurred in 1979. Three Mile Island was an an island in the middle of the, the, the river in Pennsylvania, um, and uh, there was a nuclear accident there in 1979, March 28th, 1979, for several days thereafter. There's a, there's a, a picture here of what the, the power plant looked like, and there's a little, uh, there's a little sign here um, marking the site and, and, and kind of explaining what happened. So what did happen? Well. As we'll see as a theme with many of these nuclear accidents, there's a combination of technical and user error, error um, which contributed to a stuck valve okay, in the reactor, which prevented the steam generators from removing heat. So the reactor shuts down automatically. But unfortunately, so that's good, that's a good thing. But unfortunately, the valves that regulate pressure in this reactor were stuck open so pressure drops instruments are falsely indicating that the relief valves were closed again they're not closed so because of this operators turned off the cooling pumps unfortunately this made matters worse the nuclear fuel in the reactor ends up overheating because the cooling pumps are not working and the cooling pumps are are usually driven by cold water from a river or the ocean that's why most nuclear reactors are near rivers or oceans so the nuclear fuel in the reactor overheats. It disintegrates the rods at the bottom of the reactor. The uranium pellets then tumble out and start melting at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, 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 very hot. The hyd hydrogen created when the zirconium rods interacted with the steam, right? So remember now, it's super hot. Um, everything's melting. There's steam being created, all this steam being created. So uh, when these zirconium rods interact with the steam, they create this bubble of hydrogen in the reactors, which was actually the real concern um, that, that folks had at the time, because there isn't officially a meltdown, right? Which means no radioactive activity has escaped yet from these reactors. Um, but this bubble, which is being created, this hydrogen bubble, People are worried that it's going to explode the containment vessel, which will allow the radiation to escape into the air. It never did. They were able to 
decrease the pressure, relieve the pressure, get everything uh, uh, back to get the cooling pumps back on, get everything back uh, kind of together. They didn't rescue the reactor, of course, the melting um, and, the, and the hydrogen bubble kind of rendered the reactor useless. Um, but there was uh, never an explosion of the reactor um, because there was no oxygen in the pressure vessel. So officially, no dangerous radiation ever escaped the containment vessel. Okay, so even though there could have been a meltdown, there could have been a massive explosion because of the buildup of hydrogen, uh, the bu this bubble of hydrogen, no radiation ever escaped the containment vessel and no single cancer death is thus far been blamed, has thus far been blamed on the Three Mile Island accident. There was never a meltdown. But it did catalyze um, a big, not to use a dumb pun, chain reaction in the United States where construction of new, nu new nuclear power plants was halted for 30 years years after the accident. Today, currently, um, because of that frozen in time sort of moment, there are 99 reactors in use today in the US, in the United States, supplying about 20% of the nation's electricity. The Department of Energy continues to support the construction of new nuclear power plants despite the Three Mile Island accident, despite how much it spooked folks put everything on hold, again, no nuclear power plants for 30 years. Um, and so in 2007, as I, as I was showing in some of those graphs, companies once again started applying to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to build new plants. Um, notably, no cesium-137, which is the really harmful radioactive element that can be released in a meltdown, was actually released from the Three Mile Island accident, but some radioactive noble gases were released. However, these gases, are not biologically active, okay, so for us or for plants and animals, and therefore pose no risk to, to life, human life and otherwise. Okay, so some things were released, but the key takeaway here is that there was no meltdown, there was no explosion at Three Mile Island. Despite that, it was it received an exorbitant amount of press coverage, uh, media coverage, and spooked the construction of, uh, of new nuclear power plants for, for decades, put everything basically on hold. Not even a decade later, the explosion at Chernobyl had a similar spooking effect, um, but on a global scale rather than sort of in the United States alone. And I'm going to save the details of what happened at Chernobyl for the next lecture. But this was just a brief introduction of nuclear fission and the Three Mile Island accident. And so we will continue this in part two with our discussion of one of the worst nuclear disasters, one of the worst environmental disasters period in history, which is the meltdown, the explosion of the nuclear reactor at Chernobyl in 1986. All right.